Hey everyone, uh, we are super excited here at io9 because even though the novel coronavirus has pushed a lot of things back, including uh, Comic-Con, it's no exception because now they're going digitally, uh, there's still so much to be excited about in the entertainment world, especially genre entertainment, which is what we love. Um, of course, we've got Warner Brothers' Wonder Woman 1984, which has been pushed back a lot, but we're still super excited about that one. Um, Disney's Mandalorian season two, and of course, our next uh, chance at Dune getting another adaptation of Frank Herbert's huge novel. So nothing but good things to talk about. And while we're here with the with almost the entire crew, um, let's see what everybody else is excited about. Okay, I am very excited about the new Candyman movie. And uh, no one else is allowed to say Candyman now. Yes, no, no one say it. No, no, so we, no. we got three left and nope. then we're doomed. But um, <laughs> this new movie is going to be a sequel to the 1992 Bernard Rose movie adapted from the Clive Barker short story. And it's coming from a young director, Nia DaCosta, who I just looked it up, she's only 30 years old. This is her second feature. Her first feature was a movie called Little Woods starring Tessa Thompson. It was not a horror movie, but it was, it's very excellent, so it makes me super excited. And of course we have Jordan Peele producing, so everybody knows he's the guy in horror right now. But the movie is going to follow a character that we met in the first movie, who was an infant in the first movie, and uh, we're gonna kind of catch up with him as well as the neighborhood where the original movie takes place. So in the original movie, he's a baby living in the Cabrini Green projects in Chicago, but in the new movie, those have been destroyed as they have been in real life, and he's living maybe in a more gentrified situation, but he's also an artist, like the character of Candyman, and it seems from the trailers at least that he's going to have some kind of psychic connection to Candyman. Oh, oh! How many times was that? Said it too, too many times. Too many times. <laughs> Cheryl and, gets yanked um, off. <laughs> it was nice to know you guys. Yeah, that trailer totally sold me. I was just like, it was kind of like a modern twist on like this creepy tale. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very, very curious. Like the rumor are that Tony Todd, who played Candyman in the first one, is in this. Mm -hmm. But he uh, it doesn't look like from the trailer like he's Candyman. So it'll be interesting to see how they bring back that version of the character with a new one, I think. There's also, of course, tons of superhero stuff coming up and especially on the new Disney Plus streaming service. We've got WandaVision starring Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen as the titular Wanda the Scarlet Witch and the Vision um, set after the events of Infinity War and Endgame, which, spoilers for a much more recent movie <laughs> compared to Candyman, um, saw them sort of go away for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then one of them stayed away for a bit longer, and we will we can start say, getting can into that. <laughs> From the bits and pieces that we've seen of WandaVision, it doesn't seem as if the stakes are like, oh no, the world is ending. It's like, oh no, Wanda's just having a mental breakdown. Like, it all could just be taking place in her head, and that's such a a welcome change of pace from, oh no, there's an alien ship falling from the sky. There's always an alien ship falling from the sky. What does it, <laughs> what does it mean when one of these people just falls apart at the seams? and? you know, um, has fever dreams about TV land. Then we've also got the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which gives us a much easier guess as to who's in that. We've got Anthony Mackie returning to Sam Wilson, the Falcon, who is now also the owner of one particularly brightly coloured shield given to him by a pensioner at the end of Endgame. And then we've got Sebastian Stan as well, returning obviously as Bucky Barnes, AKA the Winter Soldier. And like both these shows Obviously, not just being set after Endgame give us this this new window into the continuation of what the Marvel Cinematic Universe is going to look like, especially in this new era where we will have shows on Disney Plus and we will also have movies in the future when movies are allowed to happen again. But it's also giving us time with these two different sets of characters who we didn't really get to spend all that much time with in the movies. When they appeared in the movies, they were primarily supporting characters. They're members of the Avengers, and Sam and Bucky in particular obviously had important roles in Steve Rogers' story as Captain America, but now that he's out of the picture and incredibly old, we've got new heroes to step into his place. Of course, there are a few things that, while we are still personally excited about them right now, they're not gonna happen for a while longer. Um, and one in particular is, of course, the Avatar franchise. Jermaine, I know you've been following this one a lot. 
I have, and I might be the only person in the world who's kind of looking forward to it, but we'll get into that. <laughs> I mean, the movie has been delayed six times by my count. It could be more, it could be one or two less from 17, 18, 20, and now Avatar 2 comes out December of next year. It's been in the news a little bit, not because of that, but more because New Zealand has kind of, you know, defeated Corona as much as possible. So they are starting to film again, and a lot of people there are mad because people from the United States are coming back to New Zealand to film Avatar movies, which still feels weird because we've written a million stories of James Cameron saying the Avatar movies are done filming, and then they just keep filming. And part of that reason is that there are uh, four sequels coming out. When Avatar came out, it was massive. It was, you know, uh, it grossed $2.8 billion. It made $760 million here in the US. It was in theaters for 54 weeks straight, and it was number one at the box office for two straight months. It was one of those things that like you had to see. It was the 3D, it was the you know performance capture effects. It was such a big phenomenon. It came out and then now, 11 years later, nobody talks about it. I was gonna say, we, and I have to say for the record, I still haven't seen it. <laughs> well, I think about where, where, where this is about. <laughs> This is Comic-Con, right? And uh, you know, like how many Deadpools are walking around and how many Wandas and how many, you don't see many Jake Sully or Natiri. And obviously it's a little bit different. They're blue and seven feet tall and have huge tails, but it's not a big thing. So it's really, I'm very, very curious what you guys think. Do you think when this movie does come out, hypothetically the first one in 2021, that audiences are gonna turn out for it? Do you think Cameron has something up his sleeve that's gonna be like that 3D? Uh, I mean, I think, you don't bet against James Cameron, but this seems like his uh, longest shot yet. I think in a weird twist of fate, by the time that the next Avatar movie comes out, we will already be that much closer to the live action Netflix adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender, <laughs> that like that <laughs> whole circle is going to be fully like completed. And now like the attention will be back on the original true Avatar. But I don't know, like, like, like what you said, people don't really, the Na'vi don't have any sort of like cultural cachet. They're not, Aside from being jokes, it's like, haha, they connect their ponytails to like communicate to everything. And that's all very twee and all. But I think that in the years since the first Avatar came out, we have talked the movie into the ground. And for all of the, um, the wonder that the public had for the original movie in breaking down what the actual story was, it's like, oh, this is just Ronda Wolves and Pocahontas and every other colonizer's story with like, millions of dollars of CGI thrown on top of it. We know Stephen Lang is coming back even though he died in the last movie. Sigourney Weaver's coming back even though she died in the last movie. Spoilers! I don't care about, I don't care about spoiling <laughs> these things like you guys. But um, yeah, it's just, there's so many variables and I think it's gonna be very interesting to see uh, if it, A, if it comes out in 2021 and B, uh, if the audiences show up, if what Disney does to really make it be like, this is the event of the year. Well, the joke on io9, we have an Avatar 2 tag, but we also have an Avatar 2 through 5 tag because <laughs> we don't know what's happening. So I guess we'll just have Perfect. to leave it at that. And there is another very spooky adaptation that's also going to be coming our way. Charles, I know you're excited for this one. Tell us a little more. I am. Um, so Lovecraft Country doesn't have anything quite as um, fantastical as Unobtainium. Um, but to sort of <laughs> link back to what Cheryl was talking about, um, Candyman, Lovecraft Country really exists in this interesting space right now where you have these horror narratives that are being crafted about black culture by black women. Um, it's really kind of, <laughs> the pitch for Lovecraft Country is a little bit wild to wrap your mind around, but the long and short of it is um, you have a Vietnam War vet coming back to the country, um, a who's black, um, and like a lot of veterans comes to find that he is not welcome in his own home. Um, that is the story of a lot of black vets, you know, when they come back from the war. But here in Lovecraft Country, um, the evils of institutional racism are both present and heightened by a supernatural element. Um, so some of the villains that Atticus, um, the protagonist of the original book by Matt Ruff that's now being adapted into a show for HBO, um, he deals with clansmen um, who are not just like grand wizards in the title sense, but actual magic users who are trying to tap into chthonic eldritch energies to, I don't know, do evil white people things. Um, <laughs> but beyond that, there are also these other examples of institutional racism, like redlining, um, that are manifested in the book and potentially in the show as well as, you know, the things that go bump in the night. 
That's a good point. And they haven't ad um, updated it, have they? To um, modern times? No, so it's still set in the past. You are still supposed to understand that the biggest, like, present threat that Atticus and the other heroes are dealing with is, like, Jim Crow. Like, that is sort of the ever-present threat, and the fantastical, mystical elements are outgrowths of that. That sort of all, you know, hunt them down as they are making this you know, road trip of sorts into Lovecraft Country, which is in um, northeastern America around, like, the um, New England area, where, like, all of those eldritch energies seem to be concentrated and not much more intense. And one thing I would want to add is just, I've read the book and the book is fantastic, but a really cool aspect to Atticus's character is that he himself is a science fiction fan. Right. And there's also a character in the book who's like a little kid who draws comics. So they bring in that aspect of like being a science fiction fan, but then hopefully the show will also go into how conflicted you feel when you're a Lovecraft fan and you know that he has a very problematic history with race and the, the book really gets into that and I, I feel like the show probably will too. I'm also super interested to see like one of the, <laughs> it's so funny that Green Book ended up winning an Oscar because an analog to the book that, the, an analog to the Green Book is also present within Lovecraft Country. And it's the same basic principle. It's like how to get across the country safely as a black person, albeit in this instance, the guidebook is also like, watch out for Wendigos. Don't stop. <laughs> yeah. As they you do. You. As uh -huh. one does, as one does. Um, yeah, it'll be, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see like what the public response to it is like, because we've had such a, uh -huh, I've learned something from this show moment in the past couple of months. And I want to, it'll be fascinating to see whether or not that momentum keeps growing. So as you can see, there's still so much more to be excited about. We can't tell you exactly when any of these are going to be released because uh, things keep shifting due to the novel coronavirus, but make sure to stay uh, tuned to io9.com. We will bring you the latest as we know it. See ya at ComCom at home, guys. <laughs>